Psalms chapter 16, verses 7 to 10. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reigns also instruct me in the night season. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Well, I want to praise God. Uh, my son turned a year old today. What? What? If you count the nine months in the womb, you can turn your old today. Uh, seriously, uh, uh, three months ago to the day was uh, when the world just really turned upside down with the whole COVID and everything just went strange. And that was the day he was born at 6.05 a.m. And immediately, had to go into uh, the ICU. Uh, his his O2 stat O2 was at 63, and you're supposed to be at 95 or greater. Uh, but you know, I, I maintained and I tried to stay calm so that uh, Brittany wouldn't be alarmed. Plus, I, they had all the people in there. They had respiratory. Uh, they had the ICU nurses. Everybody was in there. And uh, she had her own situation going on. Uh, and I, I remember going into the NICU and uh, Dr. Clements, and I was like, okay, so in a couple hours we'll be out of here? And she said, no, it's going to be a while. I'm like, a while? Like, how much is a while? She said, well, short of a miracle, it'll at least be a month. I said, well, we believe in miracles. And in 10 days, he made it out. And now, uh, he's over there crying. He's making his life hurt. Yes. Uh, he don't have a problem. That's just the only way he can communicate right now. And uh, he's the youngest member, uh, soon to be top, here the second. But I thank God for everything and all things. And if anyone else has something they want to praise God about, just speak up. Please uh, turn with me to First Corinthians, please. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 7. First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. And when you're there, please say amen. Okay. These kids are enjoying church today, and I really, I really enjoy it. First Corinthians 13, verse uh, 4 through 7. Charity suffered long. It is it is kind. Charity it is not. Charity prays not itself. It is not puffed up. You have not behaved itself unseemly. Seek of not our own. It is not easily provoked. Thanks no evil. Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. Endures all things. Uh, I know to remember to keep uh, Esther in prayer. When are you having your surgery this week? No, the 29th. Oh, 29th. It's just an eyelid. I have a spastic eyelid. It's just going to be tightened up. But I'll have a black eye for a while. <laughs> and I know that I keep uh, Laura also in prayer. Are there any other prayer requests? I'm not thinking of uh, Willis stays right now. Willis stays right now. Willis. Sometimes I say it, he always got something to say to you, you got something to say to him. Now is the time. If you 
know, if you want to have, you want to get out, you know, you don't want to have a rebuttal, now is the time. Because you can't talk back. <laughs> now is that time. Any other? Well, I just want to mention, and I don't want to mention a name, but there is a young man that does not believe in God, or he doesn't think he does, and um, he needs our prayers because he needs to be realized that, there, that our God is the God of heaven and does love them. And uh, I can't go into more detail, but just keep a silent request, uh, request silent prayer to God for this young man who needs the Lord. Amen. continually blessing us when we have led, gone astray, um, being selfish, uh, following the inclinations of our own heart, and not the word that y'all have betrayed unto our, unto our lives. Clearly, we have fallen short of the glory. We have fallen short of keeping those commandments that you have laid out so clearly and pure that is forever and eternal. Lord, you essentially you just told us to love each other, to love our God and to love our fellow brother and sisters. But Lord, we, 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 we have missed the mark. Lord, we ask that you would forgive this people this day. Wickedness is wickedness. Sin is sin. It's dirty. No matter what it is. And Lord, you have come to this earth to cleanse us and to show us that by your faith, by your grace, we can overcome. We can overcome the enemy. We are not each other's enemy. Sometimes, Lord, we look at each other Maybe it might be husband and wife. It might be brother and brother. Or brother and sister. Mother and son or mother and daughter. Or son and father. And we think that we're wrestling with each other. But we do not. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against these principalities, these evil spirits. Starting with Adam, who they have corrupted. Trickling all the way down to the last human being that will be born. Heavenly Father, but you have overcome them. You are a conqueror. You are a lion. A powerful lion. And Lord, we ask that we can be on your side. As was discussed this morning, Lord, you are a consuming fire. But <laughs> you're so loving that you're not going to consume your people. Have mercy on us, Lord Jesus. 
for this old body is deteriorating. Sin has left us sick and weak. And Lord, we need a new, we, we need a new refreshment. And we look forward to that twinkling of the, that change that comes within a twinkling of the eye. But until then, Lord, we ask that your mercies will be poured upon us. You clearly said in Matthew 7, Lord, that all the blessings that come from heaven are for us. Every last one of them. And we see what Jesus was doing to the people. We see that when he came to this earth, he was healing the blind. He was giving strength to the lame. And Lord, he was making whole those who were sick. And now, Lord, as you love them so much, you love us the same way. We ask that you would look down and that you would remember Esther. Remember, Lord. Remember, William. Remember, Dreamer. Helping us to understand that your light, the sun shines on the righteous and the wicked. Your blessings are for everybody. If they just choose to believe in you, Lord, we ask that you would put a comfort on them, Lord. A comfort on their soul. Understanding, Lord, that, hey, all is going to be well. That they can live in the kingdom of heaven right now. Not worried about this body and the things that are wrong. We ask that you would take them through this trial and be with them like you was with the three Hebrew boys. We know that you're not going to remove us from trials, Lord, but you, we know that you will be with us. And help us never to forget that. The enemy has done this. The enemy wants us to forget the promises of God. The enemy wants us to doubt the promises of God. But Lord, you said you will bring your word into remembrance when the time is ready. So I ask that you would give a, a, a drive, an enduring strength for us to st study and to know and become well acquainted with those promises so we can claim them in a time of need. Thank you, Lord, for the people that are here. That are here. The world is right. The world is in chaos. But when I look into the eyes of these members, knowing that they got problems, I can see peace. I can see your blessings. And I thank you for never forgetting your people, for walking in the midst of the candlesticks, being your churches, being in our hearts. And Lord, we just want to open up every room to you. And every foul leaf that is on our body, Lord, that you said needs to go, and as painful as it is when it gets cut off, I just hope we all can say thank you. Amen.
she have a microphone? Happy Sabbaths. Does someone like to say a prayer for us? I like to say a prayer. Do you do a for this day? Must to be good. Amen. So who remembers? We talked about Jesus a couple weeks ago. And Jesus said that as a child and as an adult we have one mission and what is that one thing that we are meant to do do you remember Shemina? what is it keep others to bless others to bless others that's what jesus wants you to do he wants you to always bless others okay so we're going to read a verse in the bible and this is, I want everybody to say, Philippians 2, 5. And Capra's going to read it for us. No? <laughs> All right, she's being shy. She's not going to read it. So it is... So everybody repeat after me. You ready? Everybody listening? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, so what that means is Jesus wants us, he wants our thoughts, and he wants our words, um, let's sit up here, Jesse, and he wants our deeds to be all in line with what, how he would do things, okay? So what, who knows what a deed is? What is a deed? What is a deed, breathe? I said breathe, hold on. A deed is the things that you do. That is right. So I want everybody to get your hands ready. Get your hands ready like this. And we're gonna do our thoughts and our words and our deeds are like Jesus. Okay, let's do it one more time. Our thoughts, our words, and our deeds are like Jesus. Okay? So, let's say, what if we sit around all day long and we watch a bad show on TV? What is it going to do to our thoughts? Are we going to have good thoughts or bad thoughts? We're going to have bad thoughts if we watch bad shows, aren't we? Mm -hmm. What if we, in that same show that we watched, their words were not nice? Are our words going to be nice? No. What about if we look at picture books all day long and in that picture book they're being mean with their hands? What are our hands going to be doing? They're probably going to be hitting and being mean, aren't they? So, in order for our thoughts and our words and our deeds to be good, what do we need to fill our mind with? With good things, and what is good thing? What should I do? What's a good thing? Jesus is a good thing. So we need to be always fill our minds with Jesus so that we can do good things. Okay? So let's say, Jazzy, get up on the bench. And let's say a prayer, okay? Thank you.
In the Bible, there's a story that Jesus came to Nazareth. You find it in the fourth chapter of Matthew. And he came back to Nazareth and he was going to read on the Sabbath day from the Bible in the synagogue. And then it says, he stood up to read, and then it says he sat down to teach. So sitting down to teach is biblical. Okay? So I'm sitting down. Now it doesn't say you can sit down to preach. So this is going to be more of a Bible lesson than a preaching service. And in a Bible lesson, feel free to ask a question or make a comment, correct? Now, if you looked in the bulletin and you looked at the title of the message, if you know anything at all about Pandora's box, you're going to wonder, why is that the subject today? If you know nothing about Pandora's box, you're just going to find out in just a minute. Let's bow our heads for prayer. We thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to open your word. And we pray that you will bless us. Bless us with the presence of your spirit. Give us understanding. This is our prayer in Christ. Amen. Pandora's box is a Greek, Greek mythology. It's a myth. It's a myth of a story that is involved with the gods of the Greeks. To give you a little background, Pandora was created as punishment for mankind. So evidently mankind did something that the little Greek gods didn't like, so they made Pandora. Well, the one thing that, that caused them the problem was Prometheus. He, uh, he made the Greek gods unhappy, and they made Pandora. Prometheus had a brother, and he had told his brother not to accept anything from the gods. But the Greek gods brought Pandora to uh, Epiphemus, his brother, and when he saw Pandora, he fell head over heels in love. Love at first sight, I get you. Go ahead. And he married her. Pandora was given a box by the Greek gods. They said it was full of wonderful things 
from the gods, but she was never, ever to open the box. I don't know how many folks can handle that. You have a box, you know it's full of good things, and you're told never to open it. Sooner or later, Pandora's curiosity got the best of her, and she opened the box. And out of the box came these demons of sickness and, and troubles and problems. And she, when she saw this flood coming out of the box, she quickly shoved down the lid to the box. And in the process, she never opened the box again, but when she put the lid down, quickly she captured hope inside the box. So hope was no longer available. That's the Greek mythology. What does that have to do with our message today? I invite you to look here in the first part of the sermon. Now the serpent, according from Genesis, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. And she's right there, so she could have said that one right there. God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Adam. Now Eve sinned. And she took the fruit to Adam for him to, to join her. Adam did not have any idea what the total result of his sin would be. Any more than in the myth, Pandora opening the box had no idea what the end result would be. It's like Pandora's box when he sinned for those. But there was no lid to put it and shut it up. Eve was deceived. Adam was not. And Satan doesn't care whether you are deceived or whether you are willful and sin. All he cares is that you sin. The subject of this message is found in the devil's life. You shall not surely die. Now Satan has attacked God's character. In this first attempt to get Eve to sin, he had a direct attack against the character of God. He told Eve, God has lied to you. He's holding back from you. Something that you ought to want. He doesn't want you to have. What was it? It was the knowledge of good and evil. And God, and that was true. God was holding that back. He did not want us to have the knowledge of evil. That was not in his plan. That evil should ever become experienced by his creation. So the devil here did not tell a lie, but he lied that God was lying, telling Eve, Eve God was lying to you. God was not lying. 
the old devils attack God, God's uh, character from the very beginning. I believe that God highlighted the devil's lie in Genesis 5. We're not going to read a lot of Genesis 5, but I want you to look at Genesis 4 first. Genesis 4 has the story of the killing of Abel and Cain doing the job and then Cain's descendants is described in the things that they did. They created musical instruments. They ended up in ranching and, and farming. They did things. They made uh, machinery. They did things. But it never ever tells us how long they lived or when they died. And then we get to Genesis. And there is a, the lineage of Seth, son of Adam, Seth, from which through the line that, that Jesus would come. And each time it mentions a name, it mentions the fact that this person lived so long and then began so and so, and then he lived this much longer, and then he died seven times in Genesis 5. We have that statement. And he died. It's as though God is saying, and he died. Devil, you lied. But it's only God's people that are mentioned in the lives in which the Savior was to come. The line of, of, of Cain, it doesn't mention that. Only God's people, devil, you lie because they died. But today, we seem to have that same lie. It's alive and well in the Christian churches of today. I've been to many funerals. And I've heard about the, the person that died. And they're in heaven. They're in a better place. They're looking down. They're alive. That's the devil's lie. You shall not surely die. The story is told of this elderly gentleman got sick and before he became bedfast he, he did he took care of his business and there when he was in bed he told his wife says Lord, I have taken all of my stocks and bonds and cash from him and I put all of the money in cash right above the bed in the attic right there Right up there is all of the cash. And on the way on that die, on the way out, I'm going to pick it up. Well, he died. And as the story goes, after the funeral, all the family got together, and the oldest son says, Mama, what happened? I've looked in Dad's accounts. They're all blank. There's no money in the bank. There's no stocks. No, what happened? And she told him the story. And he put it all right up there above the bed. So he picked it up on the way out. So I said, let's go up there and add it. They went up in the attic and there was all the money. Stacked up. Just as neat as can be. And, and Mama said, I told the old cootie you ought to put it in the basement. <laughs> he didn't want it to tell you, really. You see, that's the thinking people have been. Have you ever been to a funeral where the preacher tells us that the 
person that died is burning in hell? No. No. They never say that. But they believe that. That many who die go straight there because you don't die. And from that comes that teaching. But before we get to that, Let's look just a few Bible texts. And if you haven't underlined these in your Bible, you may want to take some time this afternoon, get your Bible open, and underline these if you mark in your Bible. I do in mine. I'm doing a lot of books. Job 14, 21. His sons come to honor, and he does not know it. They are brought low, and he does not perceive it. You can put... Job uh, 7 in there as well. I think it's around verse 10. Psalms 146.4 His spirit departs. He returns to the earth. And the, in the very day His plans perish. There's nothing. Now I did not put Ecclesiastes 9.5 in full text here. I want you to turn to it, please. Will you turn to it? Ecclesiastes, right after the Psalms, Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6, actually you can go all the way to verse 10 in there, there's a lot of good stuff. But uh, as soon as someone finds it, I want you to read it nice and loud for all of us. Ecclesiastes 9. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. And I want you to underline in your Bible if you will mark in your Bible. That is so important. That is a key verse. Psalms 115, 17. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. So there's not... If they haven't run it down, they're not praising the Lord according to the Bible. Don't know who they're praising, but it's not the Lord. What are they doing? Well, that's the question. That's the question. Psalms, they're not doing anything according to Ecclesiastes yes. 9. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? Nothing. You're not going to get anything. Today. Psalm 13. Here you. Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Jesus calls death a sleep. In John, the 11th chapter, you have the story of Lazarus died. Starting with uh, verse 11, it says, These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend, Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may awake him. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Jesus calls death asleep, especially the death of his saved, the righteous. They are they're sleeping in Jesus, awaiting the resurrection. Now there's no immortality of soul until after the resurrection. And yet you're going to find that immortal soul is talked about all over the, the Christian world. Read in 2 Corinthians here, 15. We're going to look at verses 51 to 54. It's right here on your sheet. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this 
mortals, we are all mortal, must put on immortality. When do we receive immortality according to God's word? When that last trumpet blows, at the dead are raised, or the, the living are changed. Okay? So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall we brought to pass the same. What is it? Death is swallowed up in victory. Now I underlined some things. There, they're not underlined in the Bible. You may want to underline in yours. The biggest lie of the devil is not that man does not die, it is that he'll be torched and burned for eternity. For a few years of sin, a God who the Bible describes as love will perform a miracle to keep humans alive for eternity in order to torment them. That's the devil's lie. And that is his direct attack against the character of God. And that direct attack is alive and well today. It's everywhere. It's in the churches. Everywhere. It's in the thinking, even of non-church goers. That's the number one argument from evolution. It's, God it's the number one argument, you're right. It causes more people to become atheists than any other doctrine the church is teaching. That God will keep you alive throughout eternity to torment you because of a few years of sin. That is not a God of love. That is the God of hate, the God of vengeance, that the God of, that Satan wants to present to the world. That is not who God is. But that is the character of God being talked about. And it is a the reason we see evolution today. It is a uh, uh, because of that very doctrine. Science today disproves evolution so strongly that those that continue to want to accept it and believe it have to do it with more faith than it takes to believe in God as the Creator. The doctrine of devils is alive and well in the Church of Rome. They've added a new little nuance there. But back in the, uh, about the, the 1200 year, uh, 1200 years uh, ago, it was uh, purgatory. They've added purgatory. Not in the Bible, body. It's nowhere found in the Bible. It was a good deal of to raise money there. Because if you paid money, you could get a friend or a relative, you could pop them out of purgatory. And you hope that when you died, someone would pay to pop you out. Revelation 14, 6 says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, and having the everlasting gospel. I've underlined that. To preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. The everlasting gospel is the good news found in John 3, 16. Say John 3, 16 with me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, right in that very verse is the truth that sin, sinners, will perish. The gospel is the exact opposite of the devil's teaching. In 1 John 4, verse 8, He who does not love, does not know God, 
Now I've underlined this for God is love. Randy read that wonderful text found in 1 Corinthians. And we're going to read it again in just a moment. Satan uses deceit, lies, partial truths to deceive. He uses force and intimidation to get his way. What does God use? God uses only love. Love does not force. Love does not intimidate. Love allows us to choose. We still have our free choice that He created us with. Now I'm going to read Randy read it from the King James. I'm going to read this from the New King James. Love suffers long in His kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. That is a description of God. He is love. And that's what He wants you and I to be like. He wants us to be like Him. Number 31 on the list here is a quotation from Christ's object list. This is, to me, extremely important. When you read this, the last rays of merciful light. I've underlined this part. The last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of His character of love. This is what God wants us to present. Our message to the world is God is love. God loves you. He wants you. He died for you. Heaven's not going to be the same without you. God wants you and loves you. That's the message. That's our message to the world. Well, Charles, what about the Sabbath? God gave us the Sabbath because He loves us so. He wants to spend time with us. It's sacred time we spend with God. God wants the fellowship. He wants the friendship. He wants our, our relationship with Him. That's in the Sabbath. That's the rest of the first page of message. But God is love. It has to be the theme of all of our message to the world. In everything we teach, it has to be built around the fact that God is love. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Walter to look up 2 Thessalonians 2 and read, uh, well, the, the key text is verse 11. You'll need to read this one, two, two verses above it to get the context. But the key is in verse 11. And so, Walter, do you have that? Second Thessalonians 2, verse 11. 9 through 11. 9 through 11. Uh, no, Ron, do you, what's that? You said he wanted want me. Yeah, start with two verses. That'll give us the context. The verse 9 through 11. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs of mind and wonder, with all deceitfulness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. All right, I'm gonna ask I'm gonna ask Kyle to read the same thing in the new King James. You have the King James version. 
There is one word I want you to listen. I want you to find that one word that's different in these two. That's really important and key. So, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2. And it's uh, verses 9 through 11. Actually, verse 11 is all that has the key word in it. So just read it. There you go. Got to get those eyes on. But he loved the other just as much. 
might not have loved what he did. He didn't love what the first one did. But that one accepted him. He said, Lord, remember me when I come into you come into your kingdom. The answer to the devil's lie is we will not die. Because Jesus died for us. We will sleep if we don't make it till Jesus comes. But be resurrected. We will be changed in a moment at that last trumpet. When that trumpet sounds, yes. I just wanted to correlate a verse. I just wanted to correlate a verse. You said being perfect is being loving. And in Luke 6 it says, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father is also merciful. Yeah, yeah, that's a, another another Bible writer saying the same thing. Same thing. Same thing. Talking about the the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And that's good. I love the promise in John 14. And the last, and in verse 3, here's the promise. In the first part, he He's talking about he's going to make a place, a place for us. Going to prepare a place. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Leon is going to sing for us the love of God as we close on.
Father, and our loving Father, we are so thankful that you have given us Jesus, that you loved us so, that you gave us Jesus, that we may be saved, that we may spend eternity with you. Lord, we pray that you will bless each one here as we go home from this service, that we will reflect more upon our relationship with you and become closer and closer acquainted that we may really understand more of how much you love us and may as a result we love others is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for viewing our videos. Hope this was for you and yours. Um, hopefully, please to like and subscribe to our videos and everything we have, every platform we have. Thank you. God bless.